I'm here today with Kendra O'Donnell, the 12th principal of our school. And uh, uh, Kendra, it's, it's really wonderful to have you here. It's and, great to be here, Bill. Um, I consider you a friend as well as a mentor and to have a chance to just talk a little bit about your experience as principal. And uh, this is an important year for our school, the mm -hmm. 50th anniversary of co-education and, and how that's changed our school. To hear some of your thoughts about that, I think will be uh, really interesting, very helpful. Thank you. So uh, maybe we should just start at the beginning. You became <laughs> our 12th principal in uh, 1987. Mm -hmm. um, big moment in the history of the school, a big moment for you personally and professionally. Um, can you share some thoughts about uh, what it was like to come and uh, sort of open our eyes to uh, your thinking about uh, advancing Exeter as a co-educational school? Well, I, I, I guess my best memory of those early days is how excited I was. And I, I think I felt like every new student at Exeter. I was, I was full of, um, you know, imaginings of the great things ahead and also some nervousness about being so new. Uh, I was excited to be part of Exeter's history. I was less um, wrapped up in being the first woman and more, I think, conscious of being the 12th principal of this ancient and revered institution. Uh, it was humbling. And I appreciated, respected people's excitement about the fact that I was the first woman. But I didn't really internalize that. What I internalized was, oh my goodness, this wonderful place is now in my care. And what an opportunity. I felt, I felt fairly confident for a number of reasons. I felt I had the right background and I had the right temperament to do this job. I had a fair amount of self-confidence, which was very useful. <laughs> And I think a lot of that actually came from the support of the trustees and the search committee. The search committee was so enthusiastic about this appointment that it was infectious. Uh, nobody was dragging their feet. Nobody was half-hearted about it. And I absorbed all that. And it helped me enormously in the beginning. It was a great way to begin. Opening assembly is a big moment every year but your first opening assembly must have been really quite special. What, what, what do you remember from that day? Well, I remember looking out at the sea of faces. Um, I remember being incredibly moved by the procession of faculty and that I would have a place of honor in that group was really overwhelming to me. Um, I also remember being just very happy to be on the stage and, and looking out and being able to say, I am here, we're here together. Uh, let's see what's going to happen. We were uh, at that point uh, 16 years into our experience as a co-educational school. Did it still seem very new or did you have a sense of uh, perhaps more progress than you had expected? What were your initial impressions of that aspect mm -hmm. of the life of the school? Well, I don't know that I had expectations, and it's always useful not to have expectations, <laughs> I've found, in life. Um, but I did feel, and, and I've said this to people, I did feel that for the first couple of years I was here, that I was principal of a boys' school and principal of a girls' school. But they, were, they were very fine institutions, both of them, but they really had separate cultures, they had separate traditions, um, that there was a certain amount of distance uh, that the boys and the girls kept. Now, I did not have the experience of seeing them in the classroom, so this may not have held within the classroom. But it's certainly in the residential life of the school, there were two distinct cultures. Uh, and I. Every once in a while, this would surface. Early on, it surfaced when we addressed the problem of hazing. And we did this very publicly in an assembly. And boys and girls bore witness to this really rather nasty tradition of hazing. 
But the differences in the way the boys and the girls talked about hazing and their different experiences of it just said to me, you know, these are, these are two cultures which need to learn from each other, need to come together more uh, in, the, in the community life of the school. Did you find over, over your tenure tenure that that culture changed significantly? I think it did. Oh. I think it did. I think um, I remember at some point early on there were a group of girls who decided that they were going to do a little statistical survey. They, they, were, they were interested in answering the question of who's in charge here. You know, did the girls have equal footing? And they gave a very interesting assembly in which they presented a whole lot of data, which was kind of eye-opening because the message of much of it was, hey, you know, maybe we don't have the standing we should have. Maybe we don't have the equal standing we should have. And it was things like boys monopolize the weight room. Uh, the times for the athletic contests definitely favored audiences for the boys' turn teams versus the girls teams. I remember the athletic part of the, the data because it was so swiftly and effectively addressed by Kathy Necton and others in the athletic department. Uh, and I think things began to change. But I think there was a really salutary effect in people just saying, here, here's what we found out. And I remember, again, looking at that sea of faces, and they were very attentive, and there were some open mouths. They, they couldn't really believe that there were these discrepancies. Uh, and the discrepancies were all sol solvable. I mean, they were deeply rooted philosophical things. They were things that people of goodwill, when they saw them, when they were introduced to them, could do something about them. Yeah. Kathy uh, and Acton gave a fabulous talk last year as the recipient of the Founders Award mm -hmm. and reflected on her experience, really told a compelling story. But are there other, uh, like Kathy, other women leaders from your tenure here that come to mind who, who helped you move this school uh, forward in, in its path toward being a, a school where women and girls had full ownership and leadership? Yeah, I think, I think there were some very fine um, uh, women administrators, my vice principal Linda Beck, who, who did some very difficult things and was really extremely useful to me because she drew a lot of the um, dissatisfaction in change went in her direction rather than my direction. So that it's always useful to have someone who's willing to take that role within an administration. Susan Herney was a brilliant. Uh, dean of uh, students uh, and then subsequently other deans of students. But I would also say that by the time I'd been here a few years, the faculty was nearly 50-50, men and women. And the women who were hired, and I give credit to the men in the department who did the hiring and then the women joining them, were women of real substance uh, and some of them of real seniority. So they began to have a, a, a significant impact on curriculum, on pedagogy, uh, on the culture within departments. So that change went along. I'm sure not without difficulty, but it, it happened. You know, it happened. These people were engaging with the necessity to, to bring women into leadership positions and to give them a very strong voice, not just a voice, but a strong voice. You uh, said you thought of yourself more as the 12th principal rather than the first uh, woman who was principal. So you faced many challenges uh, unrelated to Exeter becoming a co-educational school. What, are, what were some of the other challenges that, uh, w that you found most significant or some of the ones perhaps that uh, where you felt progress was most meaningful? Well, maybe this is related to co-education, but I think that uh, one of the things that most engaged me for all 10 years was trying to understand and then nudge the Exeter culture toward a greater understanding of what adolescents needed. And there were 
various points of view on the faculty. And I think when I was appointed, there was some concern both in the, some of the older male faculty and certainly among the alumni that appointing a woman would somehow dilute the excellence of the academy, that, that rigor would go out the window, that we would become something else. Uh, and I think that what happened over time was that everybody uh, came to understand that the students would achieve more, flourish, uh, were they not subjected to totally unnecessary suffering. The old view was that this kind of incidental suffering was character building and moreover was really essential to academic excellence. A point of view that now you know might cause us all to say what? But this was was clearly articulated, strongly supported. So the notion that these were young people who might do even better academically were they not under undue stress, undue depression. Adolescence is a is a very difficult time anyway. Why, you know, why add to the burdens? Uh, so, you know, there are small things that happened all along. And I remember introducing February Thaw, where we said, okay, I said, February is terrible for all of us. We'll take a week, we'll have music in the dining halls, we'll, you know, have um, frozen yogurt machines, we'll have special menus, we'll, you know, we'll lighten up the, the mood. Um, then there were other things, and, and it always, it's always true at Exeter that you can get somewhere you, if you address an issue directly. And I remember giving an assembly where I said, you know, there's something here that is oppressing us all, adults and students alike. What is this thing? Is it you? No. Is it me? No. Is it Mr. Woolley? No. Who is it? What is it? And I said, you know, there is a beast in these bricks. And we can exercise the beast in these bricks because it's not you and it's not me. And we don't need to be oppressed by the beast in the bricks. So for a while, the community had a, a, a language. They could talk about this feeling of being overwhelmed and unhappy even, uh, and say, no, no. Wow. Well, that's a new expression for me. The, there's a beast in these bricks. <laughs> I'm going to take that with me. That's terrific. We're still doing that work today, and rigor has not gone out the window. Rigor is uh, very much a part of us, but we're very attentive uh, in ways to support our students, uh, to support their mental health, to help them uh, be adolescents. Yes. So I, uh, I, I think it's wonderful that you helped us begin to see that way. Um, that's really important. And, and work, uh, you should know, we continue today. Yes, so, I know you do. Yeah. I, I think that was a... That's a change that I'm proud of and that has lasted. Well, we thank you for that. Um, you did some really important work, and I remember this uh, because I remember coming back for a reunion and attending one of your talks in the assembly hall uh, for all of the uh, assembled alums. And, uh, and you talked about inclusivity and making Exeter a place where students who might be gay or lesbian felt more like they belonged. Can you speak a little bit about how you did work in that area? Because that was very important for the school. You know, when I was appointed, one of the interesting things that happened, and I'm sure it happened to you, is that you get all kinds of letters from alums who have this golden moment to have your ear and let you know what's important and how they feel and, and what they hope will happen to their school. And I heard from any number of gay alums who said, you really need to know that my time at Exeter was made miserable in part because of my homosexuality and because of the attitudes around that. I, I couldn't be myself. So it's really heartbreaking to hear a young person say at any time, I cannot be myself. Um, 
had an assembly. Again, assembly is just has was certainly then in my day the way to be as I was nominated principal instructor. <laughs> and it was in my first year and I invited back three recently graduated alums who had been leaders while they were here. Very different one from the other. And they got up, they didn't really even have to introduce themselves to the student body because the student body knew who they were. One had been the president of the student council, one had been the quarterback on the football team, and one had been a very prominent three-sport athlete. And each of these young people, bless their hearts, got up and said, you know me, but what you don't know about me is that I'm gay. And it was one of those events that could really just turn the tide for us. And I think it did. I think from then we began to grow. Students here became much more comfortable with being who they were. And their peers became more comfortable with accepting them. So, you know, the work was not, is never finished, but at least it was begun. At least it was begun. Well, the work isn't finished today. Uh, we have very important work to do uh, to live up to our own vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, particularly supporting our students of color, but also uh, students uh, across other identities. So the work that you did helps uh, lay foundation for the work we're doing today. So we're very grateful for that. Thank you. But Bill, I want to ask you. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> you were here yeah. at that moment of transition yeah. uh, from being a boys' school to being a co-ed yeah. school. Yeah. What was that like? What do you remember? I was so grateful for what was here. It was so meaningful for me to be here that I don't think I fully grasped uh, what lay ahead and how transformative the change would be and how dramatic and, and, and what a better school would be, become. I was, I, it was just, I was uh, grateful for being here. The first year was, uh, as it happens, I mean, there were very few girls and there were only a handful of my class and none were in my, any of my particular uh, uh, classes. So it was more a sense of, uh, of excitement and transition, of seeing a glimpse of the future rather than uh, changing um, my daily routine. Um, but I would say a lot of us probably dimly understood uh, how fundamental the change would be. Yeah. Some of us probably still thought about how are girls going to change our school um, instead of really realizing it was now their school as much as our school. Um, of course, those first girls, they were a courageous uh, group. They had to be. And uh, they had an uh, impact. And uh, so we owe a lot to them uh, for having that courage. Um, but it was just, I, th I think it was a sense of, of, of change and so exciting, but uh, I, I'm sure I had very, very limited understanding of just how fundamental the change would be and how, how important. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I came back five years later uh, to work in the admissions office, and uh, I was really impressed by how the girls were thriving. I was so impressed that I probably didn't understand fully <laughs> The challenges they still faced. Yeah. I was more aware of uh, some of the challenges that female members of the faculty faced because unlike when you arrived here, uh, they were still relatively few in number and not yet given the leadership opportunities that they needed to have to help uh, help improve the thinking and decision making uh, at the school. So that the change was probably happening a little more slowly at the adult level. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was an exciting time. Um, but I think we have to be honest and say that uh, we could at best barely glimpse the future that lay ahead. <laughs> and the school today, I mean, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, I'm sure some of the uh, girls here today can't really imagine that it ever could have been a place where they wouldn't have been welcome. Yeah. And the, the way they contribute and lead um, and thrive across all aspects is uh, very exciting uh, for alums from my generation to see. Yeah. Uh, to see the school became everything in this regard that it could be, and, and of course is still on a journey. Yeah. So the girls are in leadership positions. This was this was an issue during my time. But Very much so. The editor in chief of the Exonian, um, yeah. and uh, uh, we have two presidents of the student council this year, um, but one one boy and one girl. But yes, across all aspects of school life, and uh, women also. Uh, occupying uh, leadership roles uh, throughout the campus and the adult community, so that's very powerful. 
Um, and as I said a moment ago, just part of our journey, uh, we're trying very hard to, to uh, live up to our vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion across all identities. Um, and you know, we have a different language now around gender. And we, we uh, have learned a lot and I think uh, grown in how we support our transgender students, gender fluid students. Um, so uh, uh, we continue to learn and grow uh, in, in, in our desire to, that every student across all identities of, of race, ethnicity, uh, gender, gender expression, have an equal sense of ownership, an equal sense of belonging, equal opportunity to thrive. So uh, we build on the work that came before. Mm -hmm. Kendra, it's, it's funny, here we are talking about co-education and I went to an all boys school. <laughs> yes. and, you went to an all-girls high school. Uh -huh. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, tell me a little bit about well, uh, Emmett Willard and your thoughts about uh, single-sex education uh, and co-education. Well, I um, really had the good fortune to be raised, and I was raised not only within my family, but also by the wonderful women and a few men at Emma Willard. And I was raised to believe that um, I really could do anything. We all were at, at Emma Willard. Emma Willard was a serious place. Uh, and it was a place with a, a marvelous tradition of female leadership. And it was, it was just never questioned that if we applied ourselves and acquired skills, that we really could do whatever we wanted. We were, it was never implied that we were somehow disadvantaged because we were women. This is a tremendous foundation uh, for future happiness and success if you're a woman. And Emma Willard gave me that, and I think it is still giving a lot of young women that very same thing. There was a study many years ago, which is probably not all that relevant now, which looked at leadership, women's leadership in general in the country. And the number of women who had gone to all girls high schools or all women's colleges uh, just was phenomenal. I mean, there was a very clear correlation. Now that's changed because yeah, so many institutions have opened up to women that were not open then. But I, I really want to say that um, I think there's still a place uh, for that kind of community of women. I think it's, it's uh, there was no question about who was going to lead. We were the entire cast. <laughs> we were going to lead. We were going to achieve. We were going to learn. And we, were, we had a certain responsibility then to to take what we had learned, take what we had been given, and give it back in ways that meant something to us. It was not, we were not told we had to do this, that, or the other, but we were told we had to be women of accomplishment and purpose. I think uh, I sometimes talk about uh, the students having belief in themselves, and I think you're saying to some extent the school is instilling belief in all of the students. That's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, my two daughters spent a number of years at all-girls schools, and I think the same thing was happening for them. And as you say, there was no question about who would carry the conversation or who would be in the lead uh, in any aspect of school life. Um, we talk a lot here about uh, belief, as I said, and we want every student here to have a strong sense of belief. And we also talk, uh, and this is, of course, on our school seal, uh, in the words known Sibby, about uh, taking this belief and taking what they learn here and putting it to broader use than their own uh, 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 personal lives and professional lives. This, this sense of using what's gained here for a broader purpose. And, I, and, I, and so to hear you speak about that as well is also uh, very meaningful. As you uh, stay in touch with Exeter, are there thoughts or impressions about the Exeter of today? Are there things about Exeter today that you never could have imagined when you were principal from 1987 to 97? Just, just some reflections on the Exeter you see today. I think the school is thriving. Um, I'm very happy to see that. I worry, as I think many of us do, that this continues to be a place where there is a diversity of opinion and discussion, that it does not become 
a kind of intellectual monoculture. I would worry about that, but I'd worry about that for all educational institutions nowadays. So, and again, I am, I'm in the happy um, position. I'm sort of like, I'm in the position of a grandparent to Exeter. I can beam upon you all and wish you well, <laughs> yeah. but I don't have to go in there and you know fix the plumbing or worry about deferred maintenance or many of the other extremely serious things that you have to worry about, Bill. Yeah. My heart goes out to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, challenging times, but exciting times. And, yeah. and I feel that challenging times often are times of accelerated growth, both individually uh, and institutionally. And I think this will be a big, important year for us. Uh, and we're going to do some important work. This conversation I, uh, really helps fill me with belief that we can do the hard work because it's very similar to some of the hard work that you did uh, during your tenure. Um, Kendra, I wanted to just briefly at least touch upon the fact that you're a very accomplished artist. And I've often wondered about the connection between Kendra O'Donnell as artist and Kendra O'Donnell as educator. Any, any thoughts about that or do you actually keep those parts of your lives quite separate? Well, you know, what do they have in common? I think, I think they're both an expression of creativity. I, I think that you, in order to lead an educational institution like this, you have to be pretty creative. Uh, and you have to be willing to take chances and risks. And you have to be somewhat um, able to, to, to really, well, I guess I, I've already said it, you, you have to be able to take risks. And as an artist, I like to take risks. I like to push myself. Um, I like to not do the same thing again and again. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges, obviously, of leading Exeter was there was a certain rhythm, which in the beginning years is very exciting. But as you go along, you say, oh no, another opening assembly. How can I inspire a delight in yet another opening assembly? And being a painter is somewhat the same way. Oh, another still life. How can I, how can I make this? new and exciting again and again and again. Um, so there's that, which is an odd connection. But, you know, I've always had sort of two parts of myself. And I remember when it came to choose a college, those two parts were very obvious. I was admitted to Bennington College, which was the home of all artistic expression at that time. And I was admitted to Radcliffe. And I had to make a choice between those two aspects of myself. And for the time, I chose Radcliffe. I became something of a, a scholar and a teacher, uh, and eventually here. But I was always missing that part of myself that was creative, that was a painter. Wow. And I am so fortunate to be able to say that I, that I could go into that in the second part of my life. I mean, how many people get to do that? I am blessed. Well, I don't use the word accomplished lightly, but you, you really are a gifted artist. And I have one of your paintings in my office, which, which I treasure. Um, Thank you. And uh, so it's really a great joy to have that. When you uh, stepped down, Ty Tinkley stepped in, um, did you have any advice for him that might serve as advice for me today? <laughs> Well, I think I gave him the advice that I was given by, not by my predecessor, but by my peers in the school world as I came to take Exeter, to take over here at Exeter. And the advice was nurture the faculty. And I think that is advice for every principal. Nurture the faculty. Well, it's, it's, that's good advice, and they're the ones who have the most direct impact on the students. I often consider my responsibility to put them in a position to succeed so they can put the students in a position to succeed. And because I think not just of the teaching faculty, but of all of the employees, because yes. they're all having an impact on our students yes. in, in every capacity. And I must say one of the things that's been a great gift for me here is to uh, see how everybody uh, is equally committed to the mission of the school in whatever role. Mm. It's, and uh, it's very uplifting to, to see that. So, Kendra, you are, uh, uh, have been a great mentor to me as well as a great friend. I'm tremendously grateful for that. 
and the school is tremendously grateful for all you've done for the school over the years. And I know that after your time as principal, you've been a mentor and a counselor to other principals. And, and so uh, on behalf of the whole community, I just want to thank you for not just your time as principal, the 12th principal of the academy, um, as well as first uh, woman to be principal, but everything you've done over the years, um, your friendship, your mentorship, your wisdom, your guidance, uh, we're immensely grateful. Thank you, Bill. That means the world to me. Thank you so much. Thank you.